Father, great God in heaven, thank you for the promise of your second coming, the return that we're looking forward to and preparing for. Thank you for the messages that you sent in your book to get the final generation ready. We're so grateful to be a part of the message that's heralding that beautiful, wonderful event. We pray, God, that you'll bless us this morning as we learn and study and get ready to be a part of it. We ask in thy name. Amen. Now everyone can rest but me. <laughs> but I've been looking forward to this hour to share some good things with you. What a wonderful audience out there. And you sing like angels. Never heard angels sing, but I'm sure it sounded like we sang this morning. It was just wonderful. All right, I'm anxious for victory, and I'm anxious to you for you to be a part of that victory. And the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb are a part of it. In fact, the truth is, in the time of the end, for us, genera this generation, victory is assured to those who can sing these two songs. Absolutely, biblically promised. Let's see it. Let's be sure. Here we go. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and then that had gotten the, what? Victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. Can you say amen? amen. Victory over all that. The next verse says, And they who got the victory, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Praise God. We're going to sing both songs. Yes, we are, by God's grace and in His strength. Look at Ephesians 5 with me now. now let's, let's go quickly because there is so much to see. I'm in Ephesians 5, are you? Husbands, love your wives. You wives like that idea? Yeah, okay. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved, so loved the church and gave you hell for it, that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the blood that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. What is the water going to do? It's going to purify God's people as well as give them power. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but, that it, should be, but it should be holy and without blemish. Ask yourself, when will the church be clean, holy, without blemish, no guile, ready for robes, clean and white? When? Just before what? That he might present himself when the church is presented with the bride. That's what the story is about. Let's go to Ezekiel 36. Well, I'll put it on the board for you. Not that you don't know where Ezekiel 36 is, but uh, let's, let's go there together. Ezekiel 36. And it'll be verse 24. Yeah, I'm not going to do it all for you. <laughs> We're going to do it our, together. Here we are, verse 24. And I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all the countries and will bring you into your own land. Now, a lot of people interpret the land here as to mean the church. Jerusalem referring to the church in the New Testament. And that's okay with me. Others think it's very literal that God will have his people drawn to Jerusalem for some teaching and then they'll go out and do their work. I don't care which way you believe, just read the gospel. It doesn't matter to me. But notice verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. It's a cleansing time. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you and I will take the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments to do them. When is this taking place? just before the bride meets her maker. Yeah. 
Ella Mike makes wonderful comments on this. I'll, I'll put them on, on the board for you. This, this is her quote. It is using the same verses. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to do what? Walk in my statues. Now notice what she added. This is what? The descent of the Holy Spirit sent from God to do his office work. Now if you look up office in your dictionaries, you're going to find it also means official. The Holy Spirit is going to fall on his people in the last days, according to Ellen White, to teach us how to walk in his statutes. As you know, that's happening all around the world. People can deny it. They can make fun of it. They can lie about it. They can change the text and mean other, other things. They can do whatever they want, but it's happening anyway. Amen. Now we'll go to verse 33. Thus saith the Lord God in the day that I have cleansed you from all your iniquities. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. I will also cause you to dwell in the cities and the waste shall be builded. Now, he may be switching to post-millennial here, but we'll have to study that carefully. And the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that pass by. And they shall say, this land that was del delicate, Desolate. <laughs> this land that is, was desolate has become like what? The Garden of Eden. Has that happened yet? Now, some people say it is when you go to <clears throat> the Holy Land and see some of the changes that they've made since 1948. But it's a long ways from the Garden of Eden, folks. And some people are afraid it's going to be blown off the map. But we'll just have to watch these things as they develop. But this is coming a time when the land will be like the Garden of Eden. And the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced or inhabited. The idea is going to be very solid. Then the heathen that are left around. Well, we'll see these heathen in Zechariah 14. Then these heathen that are left around about you shall know that I, the Lord, build the ruined places and plant that was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it. I will be conditional about this. Come on now. Is that what it says? Sounds pretty positive to me. He's going to do it. He says he is. You notice he didn't say other people are going to do it. He's going to be responsible for it. Thus saith the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired by the house of Israel to do it for them. I will increase them with men like a flock. Verse 38, as the holy flock, as a flock of Jerusalem in her solemn feast. Holy flock. Has he ever had a holy flock since Adam's sin? I don't think so. At least not totally holy. Yes, he did. One time they were floating around in an ark on top of the... Yeah, he had a holy people then. But I don't think he has had a holy people since. As the holy flock, the flock of Jerusalem, in her solemn feast, so shall the waste cities be filled with flocks of men. That's what he's talking about. And they shall know that I am the Lord. Is this premillennial or postmillennial? When will the flock be holy and all the world know that God is God? Now or later? Later. Okay, yeah, we're looking into the future, aren't we? Uh, let's go right across the page to verse 16. Verse 16. Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim. What are we talking about? Ephraim represented what? Joseph represented what? Come on, what? Ten tribes, that's right. And join them one to another into one stick. Oh, how did this start? He's talking about, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah 
And Judah represented how many tribes? Two. And what were they? Judah and Benjamin. Verse 17, And join them one to another into one stick. Has that happened yet? No, I don't see it until I see the 144,000 in the Scripture, and they're all there in one stick, united. Mm -hmm. Hadn't happened yet. And join them one to another. And verse 18, And when the children of the people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Sayest unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, the ten tribes, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, the two tribes, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. Friends, that hadn't happened yet. But this is the promise of God, isn't it? Verse 20, And the six whereon thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. And I say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, and they're all over the world, wherever they be gone, and will gather them on the other side and bring them into their own land. You might say post-millennial, or you might say land belongs to the church, or some of you might think they're going to Israel before they go to work. I don't want to get into that. Verse 22, and, I'm like, and I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountain of Israel, and one king shall be over them all. Why does he stress that? One king? What happened after Solomon's reign? How many kings did they have when they divided? Two. Who were they? Come on, Jeroboam and Rehoboam. All right. There's coming a time where there will only be one king and one nation. At least 144,000 will fall under that category. All 12, there are 12 tribes there, with Judah on one end and Benjamin on the other. But let's go on. Two ships. That's what it says. And they shall no more be no more two nations. No. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms anymore at all. Doesn't that sound pretty positive? At all they're not going to be divided anymore. Whoa. Post-millennial, probably. But let's go on. They're going to be partners from then on. Neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. They're going to be a holy people, the whole bunch. And they're going to be united into one stick. Hmm. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned and will cleanse them so shall so shall they be my people, and I will be their God. Isn't that refreshing? Has that happened yet? No. Isn't it fun to study prophecy? Especially if you get out of the box a little bit. And I'll admit I'm a little out of the box this morning. Okay, let's go on. Verse 24. And David, my servant, shall be king over them. Well, maybe there's going to be a resurrection, and he's going to raise David, or... Could mean Christ himself, post-millennial, as a son of David. Let's see what it says. And David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. At last he's got everybody right where he wants them to be for their own good. Praise God. That's his desire for us. We know that from previous studies. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children, forever. And my servant David shall be their prince. How long? Forever. How long is forever? Till life ceases? Okay, well, after the millennium, if we're talking at that time, will life ever cease for any of them? Uh-uh. Forever means what it says. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forever. We don't even have a sanctuary over there. What is he talking about? But he will have. He will have. The sanctuary will be on Mount Zion where the holy city will be on Mount of Olives. Yes. 
There's a whole story we read one time how the Holy King, representing Christ, will come out of the eastern gate, which would face the what is now the Gihon Valley, with the city of God, so the Mount of Olives. Anyway, we've all studied that, most of us. Um, aren't you glad we're on the air and other people can see and hear these things? Where else are they going to hear them? I don't know, maybe someplace. The only way we can be continually used of God is to be God-like. If we can keep our character clean and pure, then let me know there are always problems. So you have to be on your guard if you're going to be one of these people. So do I. My tabernacle also shall be with them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Now look at verse 28. The heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them for 40 years. What? What are the heathen going to stand around and look at God's sanctuary? Well, we'll study that when we get to Zechariah. We'll see the evidence a little bit later but none of this sounds very conditional to me all right but let's back up a little bit first all right let's get into our studies back up a little bit before the restoration of all things and before the thousand year millennial reign and before the holy city is set on the earth in the presence of the heathen before all of that we will have a pure church amen representing a full gospel which includes as we've seen the song of moses the servant of god and the song of the lamb that's where you want to be folk you want to be with that group. Don't compromise. Remember the story from Ellen White? I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. What is the setting here? The setting here is end times. End times. All right. So this... Uh, Things that are going to be verified. We're going to see things for sure. We're going to go to Malachi 4, 1 to 6. And so let's turn to Malachi 4. I'm not going to quote just one verse of it like you've heard a time or two in this, uh, this week. We're going to read all the context. How much context does it have? Six verses. <laughs> it's only six verses long. But it's the picture of the people who live to see the fire fall at the second coming. You'll see that as we go. Chapter 4, verse 1. And behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. Oh, we don't want to be part of that. And all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And they cometh and shall burn them up. He's talking about a particular day. Saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Wow. But unto you, now notice, you, you who live in the days that will see this happen. We'll see that as we go. But unto you that fear my name, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. Those, those fires aren't going to bother you. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Isn't that beautiful? And ye shall tread down the wicked. I don't think I'll enjoy that, but if they turn to ashes, I guess it's all right. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. What generation is he talking to? The final generation. In the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, what's the caution? So remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him unto Horeb for all Israel, both sticks joined with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you the Elijah the prophet before the coming and the grateful day of the Lord. What time is this? Just before the great and terrible time of the Lord, when the fire falls, he sends Elijah. He sends Elijah the prophet, whatever this might mean, whether it's a message or the real prophet or whatever. He sends these directly to those in the last days who are remembering the law of Moses with the statutes and judgments. You cannot help but see that when you read these verses. That's the promise. Now, are you going to be one of those? If you are, you'll probably end up singing the entire song of Moses as well as the song of the Lamb. And we'll get into more of that later. 
And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. The curse of a thousand years of death and desolation of the earth is pretty well known to be positively in our future. After the thousand-year curse, great things begin to happen. But that's for later. Stay with me. In the meantime, we see that Malachi is going to be vindicated by those who resist the mark of the beast. His uh, prophecy indicates that those who reject the 666 and the mark as true servants of God, these faithful end-time saints will sing the great song of Moses. Here's the proof. The verdict's in. Let's go. Here we go. Revelation chapter 15, verse 2 and 3. Our first text on the screen tonight, but we have to read it personally. Are you with me? Would you say amen? All right. I, I don't have time to fool around. I only have an hour, you know. Got to go. Here we go. Verse 2, chapter 15. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and then that had gotten the victory over the beast, over his image and his mark and the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, even having harps. You know, I have a version that doesn't say harps. It says, they will be zithering with their zithers. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> but anyway, verse 3, And they sing the song of Moses, a servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works. Now, we all know the song of the Lamb, the grace, the wonderful thing that Christ did on Calvary. We've been singing that song for 2,000 years. We know it pretty well, and we're going to study it throughout eternity. But what about the song of Moses? That's what we're coming on to. That's what we're learning about. Let's take a look. Deuteronomy 32. We're going to see a little bit more about the song of Moses here. This is one reason I really enjoy going to the King James. It has it right. All right, Deuteronomy 32, starting with verse 44. If you're there, would you say amen? If you're not there yet, say amen. If you ain't going to go there, say amen. <laughs> okay, let's get there. Everybody knows where Deuteronomy is for sure. All right, verse 44. And Moses came and spake all the words of this, what? Song. He sang all the words of this song in the ears of the people. He and Hosea, the son of Nun. And Moses made an end of speaking all these words to all Israel. And he said to them, Set your hearts unto all the words that I testify among you this day. A lot of things happened that day which ye shall command your children to observe and to do all the words of this, what? Law. Now, one of the brethren that spoke here this week, let us know that most of the time the word law is used in the Old Testament. It refers to the same thing it does here. Uh, Strong's number 8451. Law here is the entire Torah. So what's the song of Moses? The entire Torah. I mean, it doesn't take a fourth grader to figure that one out. This uh, law sung that day was the entire Torah. Uh, go back a couple pages, uh, chapter 27, verse 10, and see this for yourselves. Are you with me? Ah, we can't be lazy, not on Sabbath morning. Verse 10, Thou shalt therefore obey the voice of the Lord thy God and do his commandments and his statutes which I command thee, what? This day. It was the same today, same day. That's the song of Moses. And would you like to re sing a few stanzas? I want to sing a few stanzas of that song. All right. Let's look at verse 16. Here's one of them. Cursed be he that setteth light by his father or his mother. That's, that's a downgrade of the parents, if you understand it in Hebrew. Verse 17. Cursed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark. That's another stanza. 18, cursed be he that make the blind to wander out of the way. Verse 19, cursed be he that perverteth the judgment of the stranger. Perverteth the judgment of the stranger, fatherless and widow. Another stanza in verse 20, cursed be he that lieth with his father's wife. Verse 28, another stanza, cursed be he that lieth with any manner of beast. 
Another stand of verse 22. Cursed be he that lieth with his sister, the daughter of his father, or the daughter of his mother. Another stanza in verse 23. Cursed be he that lieth with his mother-in-law. <laughs> verse 24. Cursed be he that smiteth his neighbor secretly. Yeah, do something behind his back. Verse 25. Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person. Verse 26, here's the last stanza I'm going to sing this morning, and we've got to go on to other things. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. Now, Ellen White makes it pretty clear that when we look at the statues, some of them are details, and some of them are principles. Principles are usually stronger than details, but details are easier to read. Sometimes you'll come across a statue and say, that doesn't apply today any more than it, I can fly to the moon. If that's true, look for the principle. It's there. Statutes, details when you can, principles when you can't. What we need is a group of men that are scholarly, en scholarly enough to go through the statues and declare for us for sure which ones are which and how they apply. But anyways, we're gaining on it. So Moses not only sang this holy song, but he also sang the song of the Lamb. Who was it that brought the concept of the sacrificial system to the people? Moses. Because God told him to. What did all those sacrifices point to? Calvary. Could Moses sing the song of the Lamb? Did he not understand what was going on and what these things were for and what they pointed to? He, did he not understand the Passover lamb? A lot of us think that's the, the first Passover lamb was offered by Abel that represented the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world and no wonder then God was not accepting to his peas and carrots and beans and, and garlic on that day. It represented the Lamb of God that taketh away the, the sin of the world. We're looking at a Passover. But let's move on. Hebrews didn't always choose, choose to sing those songs, but in the last days, those who refused to worship the beast and his name and his number are going to sing both of those songs. Are you with me? After a thousand years... Christ will return to this earth, splitting the Mount of Olives. Let's see it. Zechariah 14. Where is Zechariah? Huh? Not very far away. We read Malachi. It's this book just before Malachi. We're going to Zechariah verse 4, and you're going to see some exciting adventures now. We're going to put them right in the place where the Bible does, and you can correct me later. I'm correctable. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Chapter 14, verse 4. Are you with me? And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. What day is it talking about? Let's watch. Which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east, toward the west, and there shall be a great valley. Do you think this is conditional? I don't think it's conditional. Mm-mm. <clears throat> And half of the mountain shall be removed to the north and half of it to the south. Wow. Ellen White talks about that. She puts things in this chapter post-millennially. Of course it's post-millennial. Look what she says. With Jesus at our head, we all descended from the city down to this earth on a great and mighty mountain which could not bear Jesus up. And it parted asunder, and there was a mighty plain. Then we looked up and saw the great city with twelve foundations and twelve gates, three on each side, with an angel at each gate. And we all cried out, The city, the great city, it's coming, it's coming down from God out of heaven. Christ and the saints come down on the earth. And then they look back and they see the city following. Wow. Mount of all these splits. Make a place for the holy city. Premillennial, postmillennial, during the millennium, what? Post, the close of millennium. All right, let's look at another one from Ellen White. It's beautiful. The saints will rest in the holy city and reign as kings and priests. How long? 
1,000 years. Then Jesus will descend with the saints upon the Mount of Olives, and the Mount will part asunder, become a mighty plain for the paradise of God to rest upon. The rest of the earth will not be cleansed until the end of the thousand years when the wicked dead are raised and gathered up around the city. So she's putting Zechariah 14 at the end of the millennium, beginning of life on this earth. Uh, what, where did we leave off? Let's read verse 5. And ye shall flee. Who's the ye? Well, we can figure that out. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azel. Yea, ye shall flee like he fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. Who's fleeing? I don't think so. Take a look. It is at the close of the 1,000 years that Jesus stands on the Mount of Olives. The Mount parts asunder, becomes a mighty plain. Those who flee at that time are the wicked who have just been raised. Why are they fleeing? Because the holy city is coming down. What's going to happen to them? They don't know, so they run. How far do they run? Probably to the ends of the earth. How many of them are there? Billions. How many people do we have on earth now? Seven billion? A little over seven billion? Now, these are all the wicked from the days of Adam and Eve. How many are there? Billions. And they're going to get it out of the way, that city. They're going to flee. They're going to run. Verse 6 says <clears throat> that uh, when God comes and the saints with him, verse 6, and it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark. But it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. And it shall be in that day that living water shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, half of them toward the hinder sea, in the summer and in the winter shall it be. Hey, that's going to last a while, isn't it? Summer and winter, summer and winter. So I thought the saints were going to, wicked were going to be killed right away, but it doesn't look like that here. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Has that happened yet? No, but it's going to happen here. Are you putting this together? And in that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. When? After the millennium. When the city comes down and the saints go, uh, the wicked go, and God makes water go all directions from that city. And the righteous are thrilled and happy. Okay, let's look at uh, verse 12. Verse 12. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. That sounds awful. The book of Revelation says fire comes down out of heaven and does what? Devours them. This is a little more descriptive. No, oh, Ellen White talks about some of these times. Wow. Let, let's lead, read from her. I told you I'd bring a few quotes in toward the end. Here we go. Then I saw that Satan again commenced his work. Okay. Cities down, wicked are raised. He passed around among his subjects. I wonder how long it would take him to do that. Billions of people on the earth, he's going to walk around and talk to them. And made the weak and feeble strong and told them that he and his angels were powerful. He pointed to the countless millions who had been raised. There were mighty warriors and kings who were well skilled in battle and who had conquered kingdoms. And there were mighty giants and valiant men who had never lost a battle. There was a proud, ambitious Napoleon whose approach had caused kingdoms to tremble. There stood men of lofty stature and dignified bearing who had fallen in battle while thirsting to conquer. As they came forth from their gay graves, they resumed the current of their thoughts where it ceased in death. They possessed the same desire to conquer which had ruled them when they fell. All this is going on. It's not all immediate. Satan consults with his angels. 
I wonder how long that's going to take or how many consultations they're going to have. I mean, he's got to convince his angels that, hey, we're on a true track, a right track. Don't worry about these things. We can conquer. All we have to do is get to be. I mean, he has to he really has to give these people that know that they're going to lose in the end to try to win. He can't do that overnight. <clears throat> and then with those kings and conquerors and mighty men, <laughs> how long is it going to take him to round them up to talk to them? You think he's just going to shout it in the air? Maybe he's going to send it over a telephone. What telephone? What happened to the telephones? Yeah, there aren't any telephones. They all burned up. He can't even write out anybody out of town on a rail. They don't have any. I mean, if he's going to do these things, folks, it's going to take some time. But let's go on and see. And then with these kings and conquerors and mighty men, then he looks over the vast army and tells them <laughs> that the company in the city is small and feeble and they can go up and take it and cast out its inhabitants and possess its riches and glory for themselves. I wonder how long it's going to take Satan to convince all those billions of people that they're smart enough and strong enough and powerful enough to overcome God. You know, <laughs> we've heard it twice here that if you tell a lie long enough... <laughs> And often enough, eventually, they'll believe it. What I'm asking is, how long is he eventually? How long is it going to take him to do that? Deception takes time. Well, let's move on with the quote. This is really interesting. Satan succeeds in deceiving them, and all, after they're deceived, immediately begin to prepare themselves for battle. She doesn't say they go to battle. She says they do what? They prepare themselves for battle. They're going to have some training. They're going to have to have some maneuvers. They're going to have to be some, uh, some false uh, imitation wars like we're having over in the Middle East now. They're going to have to go through some things to get ready for that. They're going to prepare for it. Notice what she says. There are many skillful men in that vast army, and they construct all kinds of implements of war. Do you see that? Where are they going to get them? They're going to have to mine for metal. The rest of it's all been destroyed. If they're going to get metal, they have to get it from somewhere. They can't get it from old rusty iron. It melted in fervent heat. If these words are true, they're going to have to do some digging. They're going to have to do some smeltering. They're going to have to pour some metal. They're going to have to build the forms. They're going to have to do all that kind of stuff. And my thinking is they're going to probably bring home, build homes for themselves before they get to doing that. But I'll leave that with your thoughts. The text goes on. Then was Satan at their head, after he got implements of war. The multitude move on. Kings and warriors follow close after Satan. And the multitude follow after in companies. Who organized them into companies? How long did it take to do that with those billions of people? Each company has its leader. How do they know who their leaders would be? I mean, this order is observed, is observed as they march over the broken surface of the earth to the holy city. Broken surface of the earth. They're all over the earth. Haven't the wicked been buried everywhere all over the earth? And they flee to the ends of the earth. No question about that. How long is it going to take them from wherever they are to march in companies to Jerusalem? Remember, they don't have holy bodies. They came up, came up like they went down. Satan can do some things. Maybe he studied natural remedies. <laughs> he can help them a little bit, but they're nothing like God's holy people. Think about it. How long would it take you to walk from the borders of Southern California to the border of Northern California on a flat road? <laughs> they're going across the earth on a rough country. How long it'll take? See, have you ever put these things together? Notice the next line. Jesus closes the gates of the city. What does that imply? That's right. Up until this very time when the army marches on to Jerusalem, toward Jerusalem, those gates have been open. What did our text say? The wicked are going to see the things of God's people, they're going to see the city. They're going to see the things that they are missing or will miss forever. When are they going to see it? They have to see it before the gates close. 
because it's all over after that. And this vast army surrounded and placed themselves in battle array, expecting a fierce conflict. Jesus and all his angelic host, I just love that, and all the saints with the glittering crowns upon their heads ascend to the top of the wall of the city. You know how high that wall is? It's a long ways to ascend up, isn't it? What do you think Satan's going to have, a bow and arrow to shoot over it? Come on, he's in a warfare with this city. But let's go on. Jesus speaks with majesty, saying, majesty saying, Behold, you sinners, the reward of the just. And behold, my redeemed, the reward of the wicked. And fire comes down out of heaven and devours them. All of this is going to take time. What do they do? To, what do they have to work with? There's no way that Satan is so stupid that he's going to come against those city walls <laughs> with swords and spears or rocks. It's already told us they're going to develop implements of war. Wow. He can't build with old rusted iron because there isn't any. It melted a thousand years before. He has to mine it. He has to make implements of war. Now, he has pre-trained manpower and even nuclear physicists, but how long is it all going to take? Some say 42 months. Possible. Some say 100 years. Uh, they use Isaiah 65, 20 for their reference point. A child that is born shall live 100 years. Boom, boom, that's it. A child resurrected, old enough to have turn down God's grace as but a hundred years. Well, that's longer than an average lifetime already. God's given these people another hundred years. He's doing them pretty good. Who knows how long? Satan was so dumb that he thought he could outsmart God, but he's surely smart enough not to wage war against two-thirds of the angels so outnumbered and an impregnable city with, as it were, a bunch of toothpicks. You know, he's smarter than that. Ellen White's right. They're going to develop implements of war. He will need a much more sophisticated arsenal. Actually, knowing human nature, as I mentioned before, they'll probably build houses before they build those things. Now, tell me this. Some say, well, they'll be hiding in caves. Yeah, well, how many billions of people can you get in caves? Come on, think about it. Might work for some for a little while. I don't know where they're going to find that many caves anyway. Something else has to happen. And how are they going to make wood? They have to have wood to build some of this stuff with. In order to have wood, they have to grow a tree, right? You know, kind of put these things together and, and use your own. Let's go to verse 16. I'm going to, I, I'm going to be taking too long here. But, but I love to work in the Bible, don't you? Let's see what it says. God says there's more light. The light shines more and more to the perfect day. We can't say the light quit shining in 1915. It's anti-biblical. Verse 16, And it came to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came up against Jerusalem shall even go from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Why not? The gates are open, and it's the happiest of the seven feasts. To one they would be prone to. Good food. <laughs> Lots of fun. Good singing. All kinds of stuff. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth. What? All the families of the earth? When have ever all the families of the earth been invited to a Feast of Tabernacles? Come on, tell me. When have all the earth been invited through God's Word to attend a feast? Uh-uh. Nope. Here. Uh-huh. The Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. Okay, so it dries up. What happens when there's no rain? There's no food. What happens when there's no food? People start marching on the streets. You can see the enemy starting to grow. Verse 18, And if the family of Egypt, which pretty much represents the world, go not up and come not up, that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to the Feast of Tabernacles. They're just going to go without rain. They're going to dry up. Then shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of 
all the nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Evidently, they're all invited. They just, maybe they go for a while and quit going, like people today. <laughs> In that day, there shall be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord. Wow. And the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Everything you eat out of is going to be holy and clean. In the last chapter of Isaiah, and then we're, we're, we're told that the, those who continue eating the pig and the mouse and the abomination shall be destroyed together. There's not going to be any of that kind of food there. It's going to be clean, holy pots. In fact, look at verse 21. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah. This isn't talking about sacrificial system in the altar. It's talking about every home in the area. Their pots are going to be holy under the Lord. They're not going to be eating the wrong stuff. The stuff God called unclean. Now, I showed Ellen White's reference to some of these things, uh, but we had a um, very interesting um, thought recently, if I can find it, and I hope I can. Um, one of our pioneers had something pretty good to say about this text, of the bells and all, and he put it this way. Uh, oh, I don't want that yet. Go away. Well, I guess I'm going to have to have it. All right, I'll skip what I was going to give you. I don't want to skip it. <laughs> it's too good. Oh, uh, well, there it is. I may come back to it. It's a little out of order. This is from Joshua Himes, The Glory of the Earth. And notice what he says. He says, Zechariah foretells the same time when holiness of the Lord shall be written upon the bells of the horses, and every pot in Judah and Jerusalem shall be holiness to the Lord. The time will come, future, when every imagination of the thoughts of men's hearts shall be holiness to the Lord, and that continually. Where is he putting this? At the end of of the millennium, right where it belongs, right where this chapter puts it. All right, now I'm going to go back to, to where uh, I was. The Feast of Tabernacles, Ellen White says, was not only commemorative but typical. It not only pointed back to the wilderness sojourn, but as the Feast of Harvest, it celebrated the ingathering of fruits of the earth and pointed forward to the great day of final ingathering. You know, people say the feasts are all fulfilled. When was this one fulfilled? Uh-uh. Not yet, but it will be. When the Lord of the harvest shall send forth his reapers to gather the tares together in bundles for the fire and to gather the wheat into his garner. At that time, what time? Feast of Tabernacles. At that time, the wicked will all be destroyed. They will become as though they have not been. She she goes right along with Zechariah, whether she knew it or not. Poor people. They just don't get the point. The things that God wants for his people are blessings. They're not cursings. They're blessings. If people don't want God's blessings. They get the blessings from another source. And that other source is at war with God. And then in Patriarchs and Prophets, on page 541, right here is that thing on Obadiah 16, so I won't keep you in surprise for that. For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yeah, they'll just go up and have all they want. Yea, they shall drink and they shall swallow down. Uh-oh. And they shall be as what? As though they had not been. Zechariah 14. You see, as we put these things together, the longer we live, the more Scripture we're going to see. But we have to study. We have to read it. We have to learn it. We can't wait six months to learn anything because all we'll do is forget what we've learned. Let's finish here in Matthew 13, 47. Matthew 13, 47. All right, verse 47. Are you with me in Matthew 13? Amen. All right, let's go. Love that. Amen. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a net that was cast into the sea. Well, that sounds like when we were started, didn't it? And gathered of every kind. 
which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. Try to get the picture. There's the good fish. There's those that aren't so good. Okay? Verse 49. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels will come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said unto them, Have you understood all these things? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Have you understood all these things? What do you say? The victorious over the beast are going to sing. They're going to sing songs, beautiful songs, songs that God has wanted us to sing forever. They will sing both the song of Moses and they'll sing the song of the Lamb. End time victory is positively assured to those that sing them. Remember our first text? I saw a sea of glass mingled with fire. Then that had gotten the victory over the beast, his image, his mark, and his number. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Don't be caught half short. It won't work. Ellen White carries it up into the future, even past Zechariah 14. She says, when the earthly warfare is accomplished, it's all over, and the saints are all gathered home, our first theme will be the song of Moses, the servant of God. Isn't that something? And the second theme will be the song of the Lamb, the song of grace and redemption. Torah and Christ. Torah and Christ. How beautiful. And so, as Yahweh would have it, the two witnesses of the Old and New Testament with their two great themes will shine throughout the new earth forever. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the service of this morning, the blessings you've given to us, the book you've offered us to understand and read and learn from. We pray thee, Heavenly Father, that you will continue to guide and direct us into the things of holiness. If our pride needs to be stomped on, then stomp on our pride. Help us not to be concerned between spiritual things and the worldly. We know, God, that you have all the wealth in your hands, everything that we need, and yet we stumble, being stumbled, sometimes sarcastic, often unwilling to look and see and search what is truth. We pray, Lord, that we might be the wicked that just look throughout the city and wish it might be their home. We pray, God, that we'll be on the inside of the city and that it will be our home. For we ask it in thy name. Mm -hmm.